ask you to take the Word of God with me, please, and turn to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. Just in case you haven't seen the news, and this might take you by shock, but Christianity is under attack in our world today. It's under attack in our country. Recently, The View, hopefully none of you watched The View, but The View recently put out that the problem with America is Christian nationalists. We are the reason for the mass shootings, everybody. I want you to know that according to The View. Uh, We're the problem. And they are attacking us with a great fervor. And I I joke with you because I know you're going, yeah, I know, we're aware. Uh, The signs are up everywhere. June is is Pride Month, and here in Colorado with your governor, hallelujah, I don't have to say my governor, but your governor, it's even harder for you. But what the challenge for us is, is truly this, keeping our eyes on the real battle. As we read this passage tonight for contextual purposes, I want to read beginning in verse 10 down through verse 18, but... I'm going to back up because in verse 12, that's going to be our key for the night. The Bible says, beginning in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Go back to verse 12 and reread it with me. The Bible says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. In high places. Join me in prayer, would you? Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to open up your word. Father, we've read your word, and I pray now through the power of your spirit that you would illuminate our eyes, that we would understand the truths of your word to know how to live for you in the midst of a very wicked world. A world that, Lord, in our country especially, is very anti-Christ, anti-God. They stand at odds against you. And I pray that, Father, you'd help us to keep our eyes truthfully on you and understand what the real battle is around us. Lord, guide us, I pray, tonight through your Spirit. Thank you, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm only 40 years old. Depending on where you fall in that, I'm either a millennial or I'm a a Gen Xer or I'm this in-between Zennial. I don't really like to identify with any of those because I'm not really a Gen X or I know how to use a computer. And I'm not a millennial because really I just don't want to identify with millennials. Uh, but I, I fall somewhere in there. But I, I'm young, though I'm not. Many of you are younger in here. But I can truthfully say from the pulpit tonight, the America of today is not the America I grew up in. And I'm not old. I know that you can sit with a grandpa or a grandma or a great-grandpa or great-grandma and go, they got some stories of the changes that have happened. But as a 40-year-old, I'm looking and I'm going, we are not the America that we were 40 years ago, 20 years ago. We've drastically and radically changed. We're different. Today, we're facing in America what every other nation in the world has had to face since their inception. And that is a demonic influence that has not been around in our country because of the power of the Holy Ghost in the church and in Christians. You think about that for a minute. In the book of Genesis, when God and Abraham are talking, God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, these two sister cities that are vile and wicked. You can read those accounts, and Abraham prays with God, and he begins to beg God and say, God, would would you spare them for 50? Would you spare them for 45? Would you spare them if there's 40 righteous people 30, 20, he gets down to 10, and God says, I will spare them 
two vile, wicked, reprobate cities, I will spare them if there are but ten godly, righteous, God-fearing people. That's the power that you and I have as a church. The power we have as Christians, the Holy Spirit inside of us. Not your power, but God's. Verse 10 says, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's not our power, it's his, but we have power. But the problem is we've taken our eyes off the real battle. And we've put our eyes on a fake battle. And Satan, our adversary, our enemy, has done so good at shifting our attention. And God here in this passage helps us understand where our attention truthfully needs to be. We're going to stay mostly in verse 12 tonight, but I want to give you four truths from this verse as we, as we break this down concerning the real battle that you and I face every single day. In the beginning phrase, the first few words, we see, number one, the type of battle that we're in. The Bible says, finally, my, or I'm sorry, verse 10, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. God uses this terminology of wrestling here for you and for me to understand what the real battle is. If you were to look up a definition of the word wrestle in a dictionary, you would find that it means to strive or to struggle, to contend with arms extended as two men who seize each other by the collars and arms, each endeavoring to throw the other by tripping up his heels and getting him off his center. Wrestling is very strenuous. I am not a wrestler. I don't know how people can wrestle for more than about 10 seconds. Okay, I'm winded, I'm exhausted. I'm like, okay, can we stop? Let's take a break. Okay, let's eat some bacon. Let's just, it's, come on, calm down now. But wrestling is very, very strenuous type of fight. It takes a lot of skill. It takes a lot of energy to throw somebody off their center. You're struggling. You're contending with one another. And God says, the fight that you and I are in is a wrestling match. But this wrestling match isn't physical. Now, sorry, some of you that may have wanted to go and just grab somebody by the collar and just throw them down. You know, you're walking to work tomorrow and you're just going to pick somebody up, some reprobate, just throw them down off the ground and walk away, wrestling for Jesus, you know, and walk on. That's not what the Word of God is talking about here. It's not physical, but it's spiritual. And we're going to see that as we get into this tonight. But wrestling is a close combat fight. It's not something that you get to do at a distance. Now this is important for us to understand. God, in his wisdom, chose every single word for his Bible. The very words of God are pure. Every word that we hold here tonight is God's word. God didn't make a mistake. There's no errors. God could have chose any word to put in this verse. He could have said, for we battle not against flesh and blood. For we fight not against flesh and blood. He could have said anything, but he chose the word wrestle, and we need to understand that. Being close combat, you know what wrestling does in a spiritual battle? It'll actually stop friendly fire. Some of the, the greatest challenges to a war is that of friendly fire. The enemy doesn't actually hurt you. Your own army, your own military, accidentally shot at you. You know, in a wrestling match, because you're right there with the individual or right there with the person, you know exactly who you're fighting. You know that they're the enemy. There's no friendly fire. In Matthew chapter 13, God gives us the illustration through Jesus of the parable in the wheat and the tares. In verses 24 through 30, he begins to go through and talk about the wheat and the tares and how God sowed wheat in a field, but the enemy by night came in and secretly sowed tares among the field. Soon enough, a little bit of time went by and the, the servants of the Lord recognized that there were tares among the wheat and those servants immediately wanted to jump in and they wanted to get rid of those tares. You know, Lord, let us go out. Let us, let's rip those tares up. Let's get rid of them. And the Lord said, no, 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 I, I don't want you to do that because if you do, you're going to pull up some of the wheat. You're going to pull up some of my children. Jesus explains that you and I are the wheat and the children of the devil are the tares. But you're going to destroy some of my children if you go in too early. But in wrestling, we don't have to worry about that. 
We don't have to worry about friendly fire. We don't have to worry about pulling some, uh, some of God's children out and throwing them away and throwing them into the fire. Not hell, but just not growing in the Lord and not being who God wants them to be because we destroyed them too early. This is a re- wrestling match. It's close combat. There's no friendly fire. But you know, there's also no archers. You jump down to verse 16. We already read it this evening, but you know what Satan uses? He uses arrows. He's launching those fiery darts, and our God is nothing like the God of this world, Satan. And so God says, we don't use arrows for a very similar reason. Well, that's what Satan uses. We're nothing like him. We don't shoot arrows at our enemies, because again, we could, we could hit one of our own. And Satan, well, he could care less about his own. He doesn't matter what he shoots or whoever he shoots, it's just, I'm going to take care of business. You know, there's no snipers either. You and I don't get to sit back in a tree. We don't get to sit back on a cliff. We don't get to sit back hidden and covered and just picking off the enemy from long distance. And there's a reason for that. There's no long-range munitions. There's no calling in the Air Force. We need, we need cover. We need airplanes coming in and, and bombing this area. And the reason for that is, is found as, as we continue the verse. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We see the type of fight, but we also see the temptation to fight the wrong fight. The reason God has chosen close combat is found very clearly here. We're not waging a war against flesh and blood. It's not against mankind. So we don't get archers. We don't get long-range munitions. We don't get snipers because we're not in this battle to kill. We're in this battle to win the hearts of men to the cause of Christ. You and I are not in a battle to just destroy the enemy by annihilating them, the the normal way of doing things. We don't get to sit back and just pick them off. (laughs) Got one. We don't get to send bombs in to just wipe them all out. Though, hey, there are times you want to do that, don't you? I mean, there are times you're just like, God, could you just send a bomb to Boulder? Could you just annihilate those people? 1600 Pennsylvania. I mean, could you just deal with it? But that's not the fight that we're in. You see, when we get our minds there, we've been tempted by the devil. We're fighting the wrong fight. The goal of wrestling is not to kill, but it's to subdue and to overcome. Let me illustrate this for you just for a minute. Aiden, would you mind coming here for me for a second? I gotta throw my own son down. No. I won't do that. But you know, if I were a sniper or an archer, I could just pick him off from a distance. Archery is huge out in Ohio. Those of you that want to hunt, let's do it. Okay? Have some fun there. But I don't get to pick him off from a distance. I get to fight with him. And my, my goal here in wrestling is not to destroy him, it's not to kill him, but it's to subdue him. Why? So that he can hear the word of God. And so that God can wrestle with him. And God can work in his heart. If all I do is destroy him instantly, I'm going to pick him off. I no longer have the opportunity to be a witness and a testimony for Jesus Christ. So I'm subduing him. I'm throwing him off his center to get him to the place where he'll listen to the word of God. Now again, this is not spiritual or physical. This is spiritual. Thank you. You can be seated. This isn't a physical battle. It's, It's a spiritual battle. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, the temptation to fight, the wrong fight. The illusion here that God gives us goes back to the Roman Olympic Games. We all know what a circus is, and according to history, a circus began in Rome. It comes from the Latin word circle. It's the Colosseum. It's where they would bring in the gladiators. It's where they would bring in people just to perform. But it would be a place where there was wrestling matches, a place where there were fights. And you and I, the challenge for us is this, and this is where we've got to be really careful. Our enemy is out to kill. The Word of God says in the book of 1 Peter that we have an adversary like a roaring lion, or as a roaring lion, seeking about whom he may devour, destroy, kill. He's shooting arrows at us, and not just any arrow, but a fiery dart. Man, he wants to destroy and wipe every semblance of us off the planet. You and I aren't fighting that same battle. But when we get it into our minds that we are, Well, he's fighting dirty, so I'm going to fight dirty. We've blown it. 
We've missed the whole purpose of what God says the armor of God is for. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. God put this phrase in His Word not simply to tell us it's a spiritual fight, but also to warn us against fighting the wrong fight. How many of us have have taken the battle to the physical world and we attack one another? How many of us have taken and criticized other humans, our our flesh and our blood? We go toe-to-toe with our spouse. We go toe-to-toe with other people. But with the spiritual battle raging to destroy your marriage and you're yelling at your wife, not recognizing that Satan's the one causing the problem. Now think with me for a minute on this. How many times have we just laid into somebody with our tongue, our attitude, and we've destroyed that relationship? And then all of a sudden, we recognize, we realize later after the relationship's gone, they're going to hell. And now their view of Christianity is so skewed because I got in my flesh and I got angry and I started to go toe-to-toe with you because guess what? I thought I was battling flesh and blood. But God says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Yes, we wrestle, but not against flesh and blood. We can't lose sight of the real battle. And the real battle is with Satan. Satan's a spiritual person. And we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. And so many of us can never really learn that. And it saddens me when I realize how many many Christians have given us a bad name because they've taken the fight to the physical world instead of keeping it in the spiritual realm, which is where God has it. We want to go out and we see some person we think's doing wrong, and man, we want to get in war with him. We'll take the fight to the pornographers and the homosexuals, and we'll just rip them up one side and down the other. We go to war with the abortionists. We go to war with the, the politicians and the corrupt corruptors of good things, the alcoholics, the, the booze makers, the false prophets in Columbus. There's a massive Budweiser factory that's there and it drives me nuts every time I'm driving down d- driving down going come on I don't like it there but you know we take the battle to them and what we forget about is that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood because when we attack the individual the devil just sits back and laughs because you and I have taken our eyes off of the real problem the real fight he just sits back and goes hey keep going after him Keep calling them names. Keep making fun of them. Go ahead, because all the while you're doing that, you're missing me behind the scenes. In Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 21, the Bible says, From that time, from that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Sounds like Jesus is going to a battle. I'm going to go and they're going to accuse and they're going to attack and they're going to kill me. So Peter does what, well, listen, what we would do. He says in verse 22, then Peter took him, took Jesus, and began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. I mean, here's Peter, Jesus is trying to instruct his disciples. He's trying to help them. He says, guys, listen, understand something. i got to go to Jerusalem. The time is getting near for my crucifixion. I'm going to go, and it's not going to be pretty. They're going to accuse me. They're going to attack me. They're going to ridicule me. They're going to mock me. They're going to spit on me. I don't know all the words that he said, but those are what they did. Ultimately, they're going to crucify me. Peter grabs him, and he just rebukes him. Hey, knock it off, Jesus. What's wrong with you? I know you're struggling a little bit recently. Maybe you you bent down because something didn't happen or people turned away from you, but come on, Jesus. No, 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 you're the Messiah. We know who you are. He's rebuking Jesus. But you know what Jesus does? He doesn't yell at Peter. He doesn't get mad at Peter. In verse 23, the Bible says, but he, Jesus, turned... And said unto Peter, get thee behind me. Now watch this. What does he say? Satan. Now he's looking at Peter and he's talking to Peter, but it's almost as if he's looking through Peter because he recognizes Peter's not the problem. If Peter were truly the problem, he wouldn't become the man who preaches on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls get saved. He wouldn't be the man whom God used to really get the church in Jerusalem going. 
He looks at Peter and through Peter and he says, Satan, my issue is with you. He recognized where the real battle was. He avoided the temptation to fight the wrong fight. And we need to understand that in our world today. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Instead, we continue in the verse, we see number three, not only the type of the fight, the temptation to battle the wrong fight, but thirdly, the topography of the fight. Where is the real fight? Where's the location of the real fight? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but here's where the battle is. Against principalities. Against powers. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Four times, God tells us what we're battling against. Now, if you're an English individual, he didn't need to put all those againsts in there, did he? We, we, he could have just said, but against principalities, comma, powers, comma, rulers of the darkness of this world, comma, spiritual wickedness in high places. He could have done that, but he said, no, no, understand something. I'm emphasizing this for you. Your battle is uh, not against flesh and blood, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We break those four things down for us. Principalities speaks of the foundational aspect or the beginning of the fight. It's the foundation of it. You and I, if we get our eyes off the real battle and we're tempted to focus on the individual, what we're doing is battling the fruit, not the root. If I can say it that way. When I take the attack to the, to the sodomite, to the homosexual, to the transgender individual, I'm, I'm fighting the fruit, not the root. And so God says, here's the root, it's the principalities. It's the powers, that means authorities, those that are in powerful positions. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Now, yeah, that, that phrase, rulers of the darkness of this world, it ought to put a little bit of trepidation in your mind. Because God is helping us understand that our enemies are not the people of the world, because they're caught up in the same manipulation You know, people in the world are not just being deceitful, but being deceived. You know, back when Barack Obama was our president, the CEO of Target Corporation decided it would be a fantastic idea to change our bathrooms from male and female to whatever you feel like. And yes, I'm over-dramatizing that for us. But basically, that's what it was. That was when this transgender battle in America really began. Prior to that, there were transgender individuals. Colorado, not only do you have Boulder, but you got Trinidad. It's the transgender capital of the world, or at least it was back in the day. But he opened up the ladies' restrooms to the male perverts. And the male bathrooms to female perverts. You know, he was manipulating the culture. He was. The CEO was manipulating the culture to turn people away from the laws of nature, from God's laws. But you know, according to Ephesians 6, 12, he wasn't the one truthfully manipulating because he himself was manipulated. You can read the book of Daniel and you can find out that same truth. Daniel was praying and God answered the prayer of Daniel immediately. And he sent an angel to communicate with Daniel. But that angel was held up for months because he couldn't break through the spiritual battle that was waging above him. And it took him that long to get through the real battle. But those, those demonic forces were in control of the world's governments. And so we, we look at Target. And we look at Starbucks. And we look at Disney today. God awful Disney. We look at all of these others and we think that they're the problem, but in reality, they're not the problem. Satan's the problem. It's the rulers of the darkness of this world, the wickedness of this world. It's not the people, it's the spiritual demons behind them. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. That word, that phrase, high places, is also translated in Ephesians chapter 1 as heavenly places. It's the spirit realm. You and I are physical beings. 
And the moment that you were saved, the Bible says God quickened your spirit. He made your spirit alive. And as Christians, we understand there's a spiritual realm. But because we see physically, it's hard sometimes for us to really remember that. That that's where the real battle is. That's what's going on behind the scenes. These people are being manipulated by Satan in these, these high places. The realms of the spiritual world, the domain of God, if, if you will, the spiritual realm. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we have the account of the king of Israel, and he's at war with the king of Syria. The king of Syria is getting hot because he keeps losing every battle. Because he thinks that there's a spy in his midst. He thinks that somebody, one of his inner circle, is telling the king of Israel what the battle plans are. And he's frustrated. And he finally gets a counselor to come to him and say, listen, king, the problem is not with any of us. The problem is there's a prophet of God named Elisha. And he's the one that God is revealing these truths to. So the king of Syria gets frustrated. He says, all right, let's go get him. Let's fetch him. Bible word. Goes and he looks for Elisha and he surrounds the city. He goes in by night. Huh, spiritual wickedness in dark places. He goes in by night. And he surrounds the city and the next day, Elisha's servant Gehazi wakes up and he sees the, the, he sees the enemy at the, on the front door. And he's freaking out. We're in trouble, and Elisha's just sipping his coffee. He's like, Give me a minute, I still haven't read the funny pages. Because Elisha knows something that Gehazi doesn't know. And he says in verse 17 of 2 Kings chapter 6, he says, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. That's all that it was. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. There was a spiritual battle raging that day. Gehazi couldn't see it because he had his eyes off the wrong, on the wrong, he was focusing incorrectly. He had them on the wrong, the wrong issue. Elisha never missed a beat. He knew where the real battle was. And God blinded the eyes of those soldiers the story is even more powerful when you understand what happened. This was the enemy of God's people. Syria was fighting Israel. The enemy of God's people. And Elisha just brought them to the king's front door. All those soldiers, the army could have been annihilated in a minute. But instead of annihilating them, they fed them. They gave them water. They sent them all back to the king of Syria. Kind of sounds like Jesus when he said, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. And do good to them that spitefully use you. No, 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 no. We, we want to torch them. We want to be like James and John. God, can we just send fire down from heaven and torch them? Come on. Whoa. That's a soul that Jesus Christ died for. Though that transgender individual is, is wicked and mentally messed up and demonically possessed, that is a soul for whom Jesus died for. And when we wish their death, we've taken their eyes off the real battle. The quote is attributed to Abraham Lincoln. I don't know if it was his, but somebody asked him about the attacks that one of his, uh, the opposite party, the opposition was throwing against him. And Abraham Lincoln actually brought that individual into his cabinet. And many were shocked by it. And it, it's quoted that Abraham Lincoln said, Do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? You want to know what will destroy a transgender far more powerfully than the words that you have in your mouth? The words that are contained in God's eternal word. And when God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, opens their eyes and illuminates their minds the truth of who they are, a sinner in need of Jesus, that they're already under the condemnation of God because they've, they've, they're without Christ. And Jesus didn't come to condemn, He came to save. He didn't come to condemn, but to redeem. 
And when they realize that, and they realize who Jesus is, and they fall on their face, and they cry out to an eternal God who loves them with an everlasting love, and they get gloriously saved, Satan loses the real battle, and God wins the real battle. But if all we want to do is torch them all, I want the America I grew up in back. I read a book recently about some of our World War II vets. And they asked some questions about the, the, the sexual society that we live in today. If it was any different. And he says, no. We were doing all the same things. We were just a little more quiet about it. The country our parents, our grandparents grew up in was just as wicked because the problem is not politicians. The problem is not Washington, D.C. The problem is not Denver. The problem is Satan. You and I, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Just like you on your prayer sheet, you're praying for the salvation of our president. You know, going around saying, hashtag not my president, doesn't really make anything any better. Yes, I've watched 2,000 mules. I already knew, I already knew it was a fraud before I watched that thing, but you know, it doesn't change anything. But when I pray to a mighty God who can actually reach into the heart of our president... And prayer does things that nothing else will. That's where the real battle is. It's not with my spouse. It's not with my children. It's not even with CRT. It's not even with all the, all the transgender trash. It's not with Disney. It's not with, with anything else. It is with the spiritual wickedness that is in high places. And we need to recognize that and understand that. And so God in this verse tells us of the type of fight we wrestle. The temptation to, to battle the wrong battle. We need to avoid that. Not against flesh and blood. We, we see the, the, the topography of it. Where's the real battle? It's, it's in heavenly places. It's a spiritual battle. Lastly tonight, we see the totality of the fight. Look at verse 13. Just the beginning phrase of it. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. How are you and I supposed to battle this battle? How are we to, to fight this fight? We do it by taking the whole armor of God. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians that, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Not physical. They're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Our weapons are what God reveals here in this passage. They're the, they're, the, they're the armor of God. And God says, I want you to take the, the whole armor of God. That's an important truth. And you, you need to underline the whole armor. Because it's not just one piece of armor that we can have. It's not just one piece of armor and we can neglect the others. We need every single piece. We can't have one weak spot. Because if we do, our enemy will see it and our enemy will capitulate upon it. He'll, he'll capitalize on it. God's given us the complete armor, the whole armor. It covers us from head to toe. It protects us against every fiery dart of the wicked. And I will tell you this, there is no armor for your back. We don't cut and run, we stand. We stand from a place of victory because our Savior's already won the war. You and I are simply battling. The war has been won, but listen, regardless of that, the battle wages until our king returns and calls us home. And I don't know about you, but I believe it's coming quickly. I see the world today and I begin to understand all the truths in the Word of God. And I begin to recognize that, wow, it's not going to take but a minute for them to bring a one world currency. It's not going to take but a minute for them to begin to stop anybody from buying and selling do you know countries, first world countries around our world have already done that if they refuse the vaccine? There's some missionaries that you support over in Sardinia that struggle getting groceries today because of that, because of the government, because they've refused to take the vaccine. Now you can argue one way or another about the vaccine. That's not the point. Do you understand the truth 
of what the world is coming to, and our God is the one in control of that world. He's seated on the throne. None of this is taken in by charge. Oh, no! I can't believe it. Fight one. While I was sleeping, 138,000 votes got counted, God said. Wait, what? I mean, nothing's surprised him. He's the one that's in control. And he's setting the stage for his Savior, my Jesus, to return. And you and I battle until that day. We need to take our eyes off the wrong battle and get them on the real battle. It's the battle for the souls of men. The totality of the fight is we take the whole armor of God. And please remember, it's God's armor and it's not yours. You don't get to modify it. You don't get to tweak it. You don't get to change it. One preacher said it's holy armor. It's been purified in the fires of God's trials. And it's pure and it's holy and it's clean and it's righteous. And You and I can't improve upon it. It's, we take the whole armor. We take God's armor. Can I say this just very briefly? When you and I Ignore the truth of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. When you and I refuse to take the whole armor of God and we begin to attack not with the word of God, that's the sword that we have, but we begin to attack with our own vicious words. We attack them on their level because they're out for blood, but you and I aren't out for blood. And when we begin to do that, what we reveal is truthfully a lack of trust in our God. Paul told Timothy to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Paul told Timothy that he, Paul, had fought the good fight. Not fought good, but the good fight. We're in a battle. But when we think that we know more than our commander-in-chief, that we could do it better than he does, what we say is, I don't trust you. What we say is, I know better than you. And all that does is end up in disaster. Back in the 1800s, the circus, P.T. Barnum and Barnum and Bailey Circus, they invited C.H. Spurgeon or Charles Haddon Spurgeon to preach. They wanted him to come to America from London to speak in the large tent of his traveling circus. Barnum made every concession imaginable. I mean, think about this. He said, hey, we've got musical talent here better than anyone has ever seen. You can have them, or if you don't want them, it's okay, you don't have to have them. I mean, he was willing to just compromise on everything. We, we would have the equipment. We have the manpower. You don't have to worry about anything. We can set the stage up exactly how you want it. You can speak as long as you want, as short as you want. We will not tell you what to speak, how to speak, anything. Nothing we will limit you in. It's pretty awesome. I mean, our crowd today would go, I could speak the word of God to thousands upon thousands of people. There was one stipulation, though, that he put in there. He told Spurgeon, I'll give you $1,000 per speech, per lecture what he called it, per lecture. Now, 1800s, $1,000. That didn't look at the check. Did I get $1,000? A lot of money! This is 2022, we're talking 1800s. Here's Mr. Spurgeon's letter. Dear Mr. Barnum, thank you for your kind invitation to lecture in your circus tents in America. You will find my answer in Acts 13, verse 10. Very sincerely yours, Charles H. Spurgeon. He didn't attack Barnum. He didn't go after him, calling him a wicked, vile individual, and that many of the the acts that he was doing were ungodly acts. No one knows how Mr. Barnum reacted to this. It was not recorded. 
But if he looked up Acts 13 and verse 10, and I hear some pages ruffling tonight, here's what the Word of God says. O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the righteous way or the right ways of the Lord? I don't believe C.H. Spurgeon was actually saying that against Barnum. I believe he saw through what Barnum was doing. And if he could get C.H. Spurgeon to sell out, to take the pure word of God and make it for sale, a thousand bucks a lecture. You know, there's missionaries today, there are evangelists today that'll tell you, in order for me to speak, this is, needs to be my love gift. <laughs> love gift. I didn't know you got to tell people what to give them. This is what you have to pay me. Spurgeon saw through it. He didn't attack Barnum. He attacked the spiritual wickedness behind Barnum. The CEO of Disney is being manipulated by Satan. The CEO of Target, the CEO of Starbucks, our own president, our vice president, many of our politicians are being manipulated by Satan. They're under the control and the power of the devil where the real battle is. And you and I need to recognize and see that tonight. So I call on you this evening to think through how you've been thinking concerning this fight. If you weren't even aware of the fight, well, wake up. You are in the, you are in the battle. You are a soldier of Jesus Christ. When you accepted his payment for your, sac for your sins, his sacrifice for your sins, you are a child of God. You are a soldier of Christ. If you're not saved here tonight, well, I'm going to tell you something else. You're a soldier of Satan. And it's time to flip sides, my friend, because you're on the losing side. And it's as simple as receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. Tonight, if you've been battling the wrong fight, and you've gotten your eyes off the truth of Satan in, in power around the world, and you've been attacking individuals, I want to call on you tonight to stop that and start praying for the souls of men and start taking the Word of God and witnessing to people around your, around in your circle of influence. Your neighbors need Jesus Christ. Your co-workers need Jesus Christ. Your family members need Jesus Christ. And they're not going to get there by you attacking their political beliefs. They're not going to get there by you destroying what they think is right. They're going to get there when you take the Word of God and you show them who Jesus is. Because the natural man receiveth not the things of God, for they are spiritually discerned. We need to understand that. Call on us to be soldiers of Jesus Christ, to take on the whole armor of God, so that we can go out against the wiles of the devil and battle and having done all to stand. It's time we wake up and we stop being baby little Christians. Not to gain our country back, but to reach souls for the kingdom of God. If you're not faithfully witnessing, it's time to change. If you're not telling people of Jesus, it's time to change. Enough's enough. Enough.